The Tolkien Road, Episode 75, Concerning Galadriel. All right, go ahead. The Tolkien Road. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, a long walk through the works and philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, we take a close look at the background of Galadriel and examine why she left the Blessed Realm in the first place, as well as what keeps her from going back. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback? It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Tolkien Road. John here. Greta, how are you? Hey, hey. I'm good. How are you? What's going on? Not much. What is going on? That's what I want to know. What in the world is going on? What is going on? Say, if only uh, we knew. Mm-hmm. That's a rhetorical question. It is a rhetorical question. Mm-hmm. That's why I answered with not much originally. Yeah, good episode. Mm-hmm. All right. Are we done? Yeah, we're done. Sweet. Awesome. All right. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye, y'all. All right, episode 76. No, follow double header. All right, no, episode 75, concerning Galadriel. Um, yeah, Galadriel is concerning. She is. Mm-hmm. She's kind of confusing, too. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should have titled this Confusing Galadriel. Confusing Galadriel. Right. Or conf- Concerning Confusing Galadriel. That's right. Concerning Galadriel's confusion. Mm. Or Confusing Galadriel's concern. Mm. Mm. I'm confused. Okay. Uh, well, let's stick with concerning Galadriel. It's it, being confused is a good place to be in the beginning this particular episode because it is a confusing topic we're going to be talking about. Um, so, you know, the thought was we just were talking a lot about Galadriel because in you know the last not the last um, not the last episode on Fellowship, but you know, a couple, a handful of episodes before the last episode, um, or no, two, anyway, we've, we talked about Galadriel some recently, I'm already confused, we talked about Galadriel some, I'm like, you know, 70, 71, 72, 73, somewhere in there, um, when we talked about Lorien, right, right? like, for yeah. a lot of Lorien, and then also when they were in Lothlorien, mm-hmm. we talked about her, yeah, but Galadriel is like, um, I was thinking about this today, uh, Galadriel is like a is like is kind of like Yoda, but like hmm. you know, but like really like beautiful at the same time. A beautiful Yoda, I can see that. A beautiful Yoda, yeah. like she's not like a center of this. Like if you think about it in like Star Wars terms, you know, Gandalf is like Obi Wan Kenobi, right? Um, okay, he's you know he's like the the guy that, and he's he's a big part of the story. Galadriel is a big part, but but more in the background, and and we don't find out everything about her that we really want to, and that's kind of hinted at, like you know, kind of like in Star Wars, we find out that you know, in the original Star Wars movies, at least, we find out that Yoda is um, this like great Jedi master, like right. greatest Jedi master like ever. Yeah. And um, uh, and Josh is going to send me an email now, being like, well, not ever, you know, for some, you know. <laughs> Uh, but it was a long time ago in a galaxy you know, just far, far for the away. Sake, for the sake of the point I'm trying to make, you know, Yoda is like, you know, he was a fascinating character before there was this big expansion of Star Wars lore, right? Right. And Galadriel is kind of the same way. Like, she's this fascinating figure because we get the sense that she's been around for a long time. And mm-hmm. you read the Silmarillion and you find out she has. She's been around since the first age. And in mm-hmm. fact, she's in, um, she, you know, she lived in the Blessed Realm. For right. a long time, right? right. Um, so, but when we meet her in Lord of the Rings, she's in, you know, in like kind of this exile or something. When um, yeah, she's in, not in a good place in Middle so, Earth. Yeah, uh, I mean, she's in a good place relatively. Well, I mean, speaking. I mean, I'm saying like physically, she's in a good place, but like emotionally, you can tell yeah. she's somewhat troubled. Yeah, so, yeah. So um, anyway, that's the reason we're going to talk about her because she's a fascinating figure and. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but before that, um, I did want to mention a few points of correspondence. Oh, okay. Um, so 
last episode was on Fellowship of the Ring, the movie, the Peter Jackson film. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And we encouraged people to let us know what their thoughts on that film were. Yeah. Uh, we had two responses to it. First of all, Josh okay. did respond. Okay. And all he said was, hmm, I have different cast, story, and cinematography issues about Fellowship of the Ring than you and Greta. So, and I told Josh, I was like, well, send me an email, let me know. Yeah. You know, I'd like, I'd like to hear him. And uh, he hasn't done that yet. So, Josh, okay. you know, you're leaving us hanging here, buddy. Yeah. Tell yeah us, I'm really curious. Yeah, we'd like to know. So, you know, let us know. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one is uh, Greg Miller, um, who I don't know if we've mentioned him on the podcast before, but he's left a couple of comments on the site recently. Um, he, uh, Greg, left a comment on the Fellowship of the Ring episode, and I thought I'd go ahead and read the whole thing there. Okay. Um, he said, this is where it started for my love of all things Tolkien. I took my wife to see the Fellowship of the Ring, wondering if I'm even going to like it without having read the books. To my surprise, I was left begging for more at the end of the movie. This can't be the way it ends. Where is the rest of it? After a bit of research, I found out this was going to be a three-part movie series, and that's how I caught the Tolkien bug. My wife bought me all three books, and I began to read through them over the next three months. After becoming familiar with the entire story, I knew I was going to be in for a treat when the other two movies came out. Even after all the Hobbit movies were done, I am still a die-hard Tolkien geek. I've read The Hobbit and Lost Stories, uh, I think it's called... I haven't read the Silmarillion for fear that my head may explode trying to keep all those names in order as I had enough of a challenge in the books I've read. I love the movies and only watch the extended editions. That's same here. Mm-hmm. My only wish for the movies is they would have included Tom Bombadil and the Battle of the Shire. Uh, mm-hmm. Thanks for the work you do on the Tolkien Road podcast. Uh, well, thanks for the comment, Greg. Yeah, and, thank um, you. You know, I encourage you, um, if you haven't already, you know, maybe use our... our um, our episodes on the Silmarillion is a kind of a yeah, starting point that'd be, for that. That'd be great. You know, just yeah. um, maybe that would help because I know the feeling. That's that's partly why I wanted to start with the Silmarillion was, you know, just providing something that was like, I don't know, just an introduction to it. You know, something that a lot of people probably need help with. Yeah. 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 Something so, that would be useful, a useful tool to many. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So anyway. Well, cool. Yeah. I, I encourage you to read The Silmarillion. Give it a shot. Yeah, do it. Be courageous. Go for if it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Let's be honest here. <laughs> that is the truth. Uh-huh. I mean, if you can do it. If I can do it. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are not exaggerating, people. Um, what are you talking about? You just finished reading, like, Dostoyevsky or something like That's Brothers true. Karamazov. I did. I did. You know, Dostoyevsky. which I have not read. You read it. I mean, you read it in Russian, for crying out loud. No. You don't even speak Russian. My father did. Yeah. But I can't claim that fame. Yeah. Well, but thank you. For but you the did class. read you did read the Brothers Karamazov. I did, and I loved it. And yeah. I also just finished another Tolstoy book that I really liked. Well, Brothers Karamazov is. I know, but I read another one after that. But you read Tolstoy. You read another. You read another book by a different author, Tolstoy. Right. You said it like Tolstoy wrote Brothers Karamazov. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah you're right. I did. Yeah. That's not what I meant to say. Well, it's a good thing I was here. To I finished you. my second Tolstoy novel. The other one was not. Brothers K because he didn't write it. There we go. Clarified. Um, Greg, I'm into a Russian lit geek, I guess. Anyway, there you go. Russian lit Tolkien. I yeah. mean, there's got to be connection there somewhere. Sure, uh, I'm sure there's not. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's not. <laughs> All right. Then uh, Greg also left a comment on the Gandalf episode. He said, "This is a good one." Listening to this, and can't help but laugh in agreement with Greta's connection between the Istari and Atari. Oh. Well, you might find <laughs> it interesting to know that there was a Lord of the Rings game for the Atari that was never official, officially released, but it did make the rounds as a leaked digital game. It's oh. called Lord of the Rings Journey to Rivendell. I've played it, and it's fun if you are into the older retro game scene. thought you might be interested, or at least to know of the coincidence. You can find the info on it here, and it's at a site called AtariAge.com. Um, That's and awesome. you, you can find the link if you go on and, and uh, look for that comment from Greg. I think it's on the uh, in reference to the Gandalf episode, which was okay. like seventy one or seventy I or can't something. Keep them straight. Yeah, but anyway, That's really cool though. Yeah, it so, makes me want to go buy an Atari. I hope it's better. So I, I hope it's game. better than the old um, ET game they made for uh, made for the Atari, which is like Whoa. you know renowned as like one of the worst. I, really? I remember playing that game though all the time. So you had an Atari I, growing up? No, my grandparents did. Oh, that, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, and but I remember playing the ET game on the original Atari, and 
and it's I, I guess the story on it is they like you know ET was this huge film hit so they thought it was going to be right. this like big marketing opportunity yeah. they, they made all these games and everybody was like this game sucks <laughs> oh no and um, even back in the day like you know like the Atari which is like the most basic you know video game system and um, uh, but I just remember that you would always get stuck in this pit. And it was, like, impossible to get out of there. It's like, here I am, like, this six-year-old kid, like, why can't I get out of the pit? <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. That was much fun. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's good memories now. Yeah. All right. Um, well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the correspondence. Yes, story. thank you, guys. Good hearing from it's you. Great. And uh, and Josh as well. Josh, we do want to hear your thoughts on Lord of the Rings, the, or the Fellowship of the Ring. He's Jackson's. probably working on a novella right now about it. Yeah. That's probably why he hasn't written it. I mean, sent it because it's not finished. Probably, yeah. He's probably working on it in a scholarly form uh-huh. or something or other. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So, one other thing. Next episode is on a Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, haiku for a Kalabath is due um, on September 7th. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You mentioned that last You time. know what? And come to think of it, um, Rob... Rob Fangman has has submitted some haiku and poems on Aragorn that I did I don't have in front of me, but we'll have them for the next episode. Oh, cool! I'll put them on. The, I'll make sure they're part of the next episode. Awesome. I think that's I think that's what he submitted them for. I'm hoping I didn't I didn't forget to read them on like the last. I know, I know. I need to get job. I need to get all consolidated. Like I don't believe you need to hire you know, like a like a social media relations. Send personnel. haiku to John here at gmail dot com. Um, <laughs> well. Whatever works. Yeah. Yeah. This one t- a l- little story that brings to mind. Uh, I once had a guy I worked with that he, like, went on vacation. He was, like, it was, he was kind of new to the company, and he went on vacation. Mm-hmm. And he was like, okay, guys, if uh, anybody needs to get in touch with me, just email me here. And the email address was, like, if you need to email Jay while he's on vacation, then you email him here. Uh, but don't do it unless you really need to at gmail.com. Anyway, I thought that's that was clever. funny. That's very clever. Yeah. Anyway, was it like a real email? Yeah. It was. It actually worked. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Last resort email for j at gmail dot com. That's anyway. great. That's um, great. Okay. Well, that was a kind of worthless story, and then I found twenty bucks right after that, so that was awesome. <laughs> Way right. to salvage it. Yeah. Um. Okay. So we're talking about Galadriel because she's fascinating. Yep. And she's seemingly powerful, and mm-hmm. she's, like, wise, mm-hmm. and um, a beautiful Yoda, and um, she yeah. just seems like, and, and, and I, I don't know, like, people seem like, she's like a character that lots of people seem drawn to. She's like a yeah. secondary character of the Lord of the Rings that lots of people seem drawn to. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And it is a particularly fascinating one. So, um, so... Let's start off just by talking about, um, but but she's got kind of a puzzling history, and that's so this this episode could get confusing, and we were saying that at the beginning, but part of that is because even though we've tried to do some research for this, we're still a little mm-hmm. confused on it, and even Christopher Tolkien was confused on it. That's because I know. think J.R.R. Tolkien was confused about <laughs> exactly, it, exactly, <laughs> which is the root of the problem. So <laughs> we'll we'll get to that part. He never um, made up his mind what he wanted her history to be. I don't right. think. But let's talk about her name first. Um, yes. So, why don't you read for me? Um, let's see. You can read this I short... I think I even read, like, two different definitions of her name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, here's... This is from a letter uh, November from November 30th of 1972. Um, read the second par- the paragraph that talks about Claudia okay. there. Arwen was not an elf, but one of the half elven who abandoned her who abandoned her elvish rites. Galadriel, or glittering garland, garland, is the chief elvish woman mentioned in the Lord of the Rings. Her daughter was Calabrian, yes, Silver Queen. There was also Nimrodel, but I shouldn't really like these names to be given to heifers or cows. If you care for the Ar- our moon type, I could invent a few female names, but though it is made on classical models rather than elvish, wouldn't the name of Farmer Giles' favorite cow, Galath- Gal- Galathia in Farmer Giles of Ham, be useful? Which, as it stands, might be interpreted goddess of milk. 
Yours sincerely, J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, so I just thought that, that was like, funny just, because... That is really funny. When you go back and read, like... Because that was the second letter in a series, right? Or, no, it was a response to a letter. Right, it was just a different letter, but... Um, yeah. Uh, it's... Um, uh, what we get there, that what's, re- what's really relevant to the topic at hand, is that Galadriel so means she glittering. She to name her cattle ranch after yeah. Rivendell. And so right. She wanted to name her cows elves, and so she was consult after well, elves. Well, that's just kind of funny, but like the important thing is that her name oh, means glittering garland. Imp- I thought that was the important thing. You didn't think that was important? That the cows was, thing? She wanted to name her cows after elves. I thought that it's was really humorous. funny. It's humorous. That she, that she consulted J.R. Tolkien about the names of her heifers yeah. and cows. Um, anyway, okay, so the truly important thing. Right, is that Galadriel means glittering garland. Glittering garland, yeah. yes. And then um, a letter he wrote just a few months later to um, Mrs. Catherine Findlay uh, says, Galadriel, like all the other names of elvish persons in The Lord of the Rings, is an invention of my own. It is in Sindarin form and means maiden crowned with gleaming hair. It is a secondary name given to her in her youth, in the far past, because she had long hair which glistened like gold, but was also shot with silver. She was then of Amazon disposition and bound up her hair as a crown when taking part in athletic feats. So, um, so her name literally, I guess, means glittering garland in Sindarin. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. and, but, you know, it's supposed to signify maiden crown with gleaming hair, right? Okay. So her name, Galadriel, refers to her hair. Right. right. That Got is it. beautiful hair. Yes. Um, now, she does have other names. So, Galadriel is a secondary name. It's a, it's a, it, it's not her original name. Right. Um, her original name, she has two. Mm-hmm. Okay. The first is on her father's side, which do you remember who her father is? Uh, Owe? No. No. She's related to Owe, though, right? She is. Oh, it's Finarfin. Finarfin. That's right. right. Finarfin, one of the sons of Fenway, one of the Noldor, right? So on her father's side, she's a Noldor. On, um, and so the, her name there is Artanis, Artanis, which means noble woman. Okay. And then on her mother's side, uh, her name is Nerwin, which means man maiden. All right. Okay. Um, and that's supposed to signify like Tolkien was talking about there. She was athletic, mm-hmm. right? She was like. You know, she she was not like this kind of like small smaller woman. Like she was like yeah, almost like built. warrior, like strong. Yeah. You know, Amazonian, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, athletic. You know, able. She was able to take part in like I guess athletic competitions that normally only the male elves would be able to take part in against one another, right? Right. So, um, you know, she was strong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, strong and beautiful. Force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. So, yeah, Artanis on her father's side, Nerwin on her mother's side. Um, and, uh, and we find, um, we find about her hair that it, uh, it was lit with gold as though it had caught in a mesh the radiance of Laurelin, right? Mm-hmm. We find that in the Silmarillion, mm-hmm. um, on page 61 of my edition. Um, and... What's what's interesting to me about her lineage is though she is Noldoran by her father's, mm-hmm. just, you know, by her father's right. line. Um, her mother was. Um, hold on, let me make sure I get this right. Her mother was. Where is it? Um, Dunno. Um, yeah. Her mother was uh, Aarwen, Yarwen, mm-hmm. Yarwen, on who was descended from Olwe, who was a Teleri. Now, so she's got Noldoran and Teleri mm-hmm. blood, but mm-hmm. Finarfin's mother was a Vanyar, right? Finarfin's mother was, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. So her Endus. grandmother... Huh? So Galadriel's right. grandmother. Galadriel's mother. I thought you said Fenarfin. No, I'm sorry, mother. Galadriel's grandmother. Grandmother, yes. Oh, okay. Was Indus of the Vanyar, right? Mm. So that means that Galadriel had Vanyar, Noldor, and Teleri blood, right? So she's got like all three of the races of the Eldar, of the clans of the yeah. Eldar are, you know, within her person, right? Wow, yeah. So... 
that's something interesting about about her. Mm-hmm. You know, is that she has cool. she has descent from all of them, so she's a blended Eldar. Yes. Right. She yes. she she has the uh, the best of all three worlds, I guess you could say. Yeah. Right. Um, Can't do much better than that. Yeah. Um, so, um, and you know, we find out in the Silmarillion that she was the most beautiful of all the House of Fenway. Um, and lastly, in addition to being beautiful, strong, um, having lineage from all three parts of the Eldar, she had, um, she loved journeying, right? She loved to kind of like go about and roam, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So she wasn't one of these people that liked to just stay at home and like, um, and just kind of sit at the feet of the, the the, the Vanyar part of her didn't really you know, um, take hold in that way, right? right. She do, she wasn't just content to sit in Valinor and like you know just bask in the glow of the Valar, right? Right. right. Um, bask at the feet of, of Manway. She wanted she wanted to go out and about and and see the world, see yes. Middle Earth, right? Yes. Um. And um. Uh. So that's that's kind of who Galadriel is, mm-hmm. right? One other interesting note about her before we get to the big problem, um, if you if you use and a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about comes from unfinished tales, um, in the chapter on Celeborn and Galadriel, um, but and we mentioned this previously on the episode because um, who was it? I think Chris. I think it was Chris uh, Magia Smith um, sent me a note after one of the episodes about her and said um, the Silmarils were based on her hair, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and so in unfinished tales on two thirty of my edi- page two thirty of my edition. Um, we have, or no, what he was saying was that Fandor had asked for a strand of her hair and she had said no. Oh. Where, and, but she had given three to Gimli, right? Right. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Um, yes. But I think it says in there that, that they think that maybe where Fanor got the idea. Right. For the Silmarils. Right. Um, it says this about her hair. Um, even among the Eldar, she was accounted beautiful, and her hair was held a marble unmatched. It was golden like the hair of her father and of her foremother, Indus, but richer and more radiant, for its gold was touched by some memory of the star-like silver of her mother. And the Eldar said that the light of the two trees, Laurelin and Telperion, had been snared in her tresses. Many thought this that this saying first gave to Feanor the thought of imprisoning and blending the light of the trees that later took shape in his hands as the Silmarils. For Feanor beheld the hair of Galadriel with wonder and delight. He begged three times for a tress, but Galadriel would not give him even one hair. These two kinsfolk, the greatest of the Eldar of Valinor, were unfriends forever. Unfriends, I think that's a great, yeah. that's a great term. Right. <laughs> when you're mad at somebody, be like, we're unfriends now. Yeah, that's a very Tolkien thing to say because mm-hmm. it's like a, you know, um, it's like... It's like an early, like you know, when you're in that early stage of a new language and you're trying to come up with new words for things, mm-hmm. and you don't, you know, you don't have this all these fully developed concepts, and so you're like, well, the opposite of what's the opposite of a friend? What's a no friend? It's an unfriend, right? Right. right. Um, what's right. an enemy? It's a no friend. It's an unfriend, right? Yes. yes. Um. So, but interesting again to note, Gladriel, fascinating. Mm-hmm. The Silmarils are apparently based. The light of the Silmarils are based, you know, or inspired in a way by her yeah, hair. Yeah, it's by her hair. Right. Yeah. And isn't it interesting that, that Feanor asked three times and didn't get anything? Yeah. And then Gimli asked once and got three? Yeah. The, the number three. Yeah. It's, uh, it's fascinating. And, and, you know, we talked some about that on that episode. Yeah. But it's, uh, it shows how that's kind of a gesture towards, you know, the healing of the rift between the elves and the dwarves. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, this is, uh, this, in the eyes of at least some of the elves, that her hair, you know, is on par, like, with the Silmarils, right? I wonder if she had given him, if she had just had given him a hair, if he would have not, if Feanor would have not felt the need to create the Silmarils. Yeah. We'll never know. We'll never know. Yeah, but we can he, only wonder. Then there being, you know, a Silmarillion wouldn't... <laughs> would have been right there. Wouldn't exist, so... <laughs> yeah. Would have been as good a story. No, it would have been a little flat, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so that's a little bit of the background right. of Galadriel. Yep. Um, now, when we meet up with Galadriel and Lord of the Rings, you get this sense that um, she's in exile, right? That she has 
uh, she she wishes she was back in Valinor, but she's unable to go, right? For some reason, for whatever reason. And right. so, you know, that makes you want to dig into why is that? Why wasn't she able to go back, right, to to Valinor? Um, and um, eventually we find out, you know, we do find out she does eventually go back. And, you know, there's a scene with the, the mirror there where Frodo offers her the ring and she passes the test, right? Right, right. Um, but, you know, just... Digging into it, what's this all about? And so, um, uh, well, I'll set the stage by reading this little snippet from Unfinished Tales. The exiles were allowed to return, save for a few chief actors in the rebellion, of whom at the time of the Lord of the Rings only Galadriel remained. So the rebellion refers to the rebellion of the Noldor. Noldor right, right. right? Yeah. They're leaving uh, after the destruction of the two trees, the theft of the Silmarils by Melkor. They they kind of leave in a huff to go right, hunt led down, by Feanor, right, right, to yeah. go hunt down Morgoth. Right, right. Um, Against the Valar's wishes. Right, yeah. and um, uh, and so at the time of her lament in Lorien, Galadriel believed this exile to be perennial as long as the earth endured. Hence, she concluded her lament with a wish or prayer that Frodo may as a special grace be granted a purgatorial but not penal Sojourn in Erisea, the solitary isle in sight of Amman, though for her the way is closed. Her prayer was granted, but also her personal ban was lifted in reward for her services against Sauron, and above all for her rejection of the temptation to take the ring when offered to her. So at the end, we see her taking ship. Um, so, uh, in a way, you know, she... As far as she knows, even at the time of the at the mirror when she's offered the ring, she doesn't know that she's going to be allowed back. She doesn't. She thinks it's hopeless that she's ever going to be able to go back. Right. You know, she thinks it's a permanent ban on her going back. Right. Um, and, and she rejects it anyway. Right, or she rejects it earlier on. You know what I'm saying? Like she rejects the the possibility of going back earlier on, and that's. And that may be where the band comes from because, um, mm-hmm. and, and that's, that's the rub, um, that's the rub a little bit, right? Um, uh, why, what did she do? How, how involved with the rebellion was she? And right. how did she, how did she get involved in this band in the first place? Right. Um, so. Well, she went with them, didn't she? Well, so that's where it gets confusing because Tolkien couldn't really make up his mind on this point. Mm-hmm. All right. Um. In, a, in an essay he wrote called The Road Goes Ever On, he talks some about this, and he says that um, uh, the light, the light, when the light of Valinor failed, for even as Noldor thought she joined the rebellion, Gladriel joined the rebellion against the Valar, who commanded them to stay. And once she had set foot upon the road of exile, she would not relent, but rejected the last message of the Valar and came under the doom of Mondos. Even after the merciless assault upon the Teleri and the rape of their ships, Though she fought fiercely against Fanor in defense of her mother's kin, she did not turn back. Her pride was unwilling to return, a defiant suppliant, a defeated suppliant for pardon. But now she burned with desire to follow Fanor with her anger to whatever lands he might come and to thwart him in all ways that she could. Pride still moved her when, at the end of the Elder Days, after the final overthrow of Morgoth, she refused the pardon of the Valar for all who had fought against him and remained in Middle-earth. It was not until two long ages more had passed when at last all that she had desired in her youth came to her hand, the ring of power and the dominion of Middle-earth, of which she had dreamed, and that her wisdom was full-grown and she rejected it, and passing the last test, departed from Middle-earth forever. So basically he's saying that she didn't take part in like the kinslaying, but she did kind of, even though she wasn't a fan of Feanor, um, she, you know, she rebelled against this notion that they had to stay put, that right. you know the, the Valar's command to the elves to stay put, right. right? But it was more. It sounds like it was more out of a, out of that love for traveling, like like just wanting to get out. Yeah, but even so, it's like in a time of crisis, you yeah, know, you still obey. You know, like yeah, you're, there was an authority over you, right? But it was not out of it was it was not out of allegiance to Feanor mm-hmm. that she left, right? Maybe she just saw her opportunity. And said, oh, they're leaving, I'll just go with them, and then I get to travel the world. Right, right. Um, so, um, and, and there's, there's a lot of pride here, too, right? That was the other key thing. Is it's not just this that I want to go, but it's a, um, she kind of got 
dead set on this yes. and refused. Yes. And each time you refuse in that kind of situation, it kind of hardens you towards something. That's true. And so yeah. she had a pride, you know, she had a, she, she had a pride, pride she, towards yeah. the Valar, mm-hmm. right? Um, and after the final, so after the final overthrow of Morgoth, even then, after, you know, 400 years after the, their departure, right? Mm-hmm. She is still refusing the pardon of the Valar to go back. Okay. Right. So there's still a lot of pride there. And it was only after, you know, 6,000 more years um, of exile that she finally kind of wised up. And it's interesting to note that the ring for her represented the dominion of Middle-earth, right? The dominion mm-hmm. of all these lands, mm-hmm. right? Rulership over all these things. And that's and so, what she wanted. Right. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, the, the object of her desire in the first place was to go into these other lands and right. to rule them, be in them, whatever. But... Um, and so that's where the pride, that's where the original problem for her came from. But now, 6,000 years later, she finally is wise enough to refuse what's set before her. And in doing so, she kind of, you know, I guess fully repents or completes her, you know, completes her penance, right? In a way. Yeah. Um, and I, I do want to, I'm going to come back to that, but I want to, um, I want to talk about. A couple of letters, a couple of things that Tolkien said in a few of his letters. Um, so, let's see here. Um, he says, I think it is true that I owe much of uh, this character, Gladriel, to Christian and Catholic teaching and imagination about Mary, but actually Gladriel was a penitent. In her youth, a leader in the rebellion against the Valar, the angelic guardians. At the end of the first stage, she proudly refused forgiveness or permission to return. She was pardoned because of her resistance to the final and overwhelming temptation to take the ring for herself. So again, we have that confirmed. And this is January of 1971. By the way, little aside, uh, today is the, this is September 2nd of 2016. It is the 43rd anniversary of Tolkien's Mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. So... Just FYI, because we're actually talking about a lot of stuff that apparently he was thinking about towards the end of his life, oh, right? Um, interesting. Which is kind of interesting to me, and I don't, I don't want to read it too biographically, but it is interesting to think about if he was, you know, being, you know, because um, Edith died, you know, around this time, or maybe even mm-hmm. earlier, and his death, I mean, he was an old man at this point, right? He was late 70s, early 80s at this point when he's thinking about these things right. when he wrote that letter. Right. Um, and in the next one, I'll read. Um, so apparently, he's thinking a lot about like penance and mm-hmm. being in ato- and, and like being sorry and, and atoning for one's past transgressions and that kind of thing. And purgatory. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it would seem so. Yeah. Right? That, uh, it's, it at least seems like it's on his mind. Now, maybe I'm reading that too biographically. I submit that that could be the case, but I'll just I'll just put that out there as something that occurs to me. Um, and then. Uh, and then in 1973, just you know, just a short time before his death, this is on the 4th of August, so basically a month before he died. Mm-hmm. Um, what year is Two it? years after the previous letter, that two and a half years after the previous year, I, letter I just read, right? Okay. Where he says she was involved in the rebellion, right, against the Valar. Here he says, Galadriel was unstained. She had committed no evil deeds. She was an enemy of Feanor. She did not reach Middle-earth with the other Noldor, but independently. Her reasons for desiring to go to Middle-earth were legitimate, and she would have been permitted to depart, but for the misfortune that before she set out, the revolt of Feanor broke out, and she became involved in the desperate measures of Monway and the ban on all immigration. Um, So it's interesting there that he calls her unstained, that she committed no evil deeds, because that sure, while it's not the same level of evil as what Feanor had done, Mm -hmm. what she did sure does seem evil in light of the knowledge that the Valar are supposed to be the most powerful creature, so... Um, and, and, and not just the most powerful, but the ones that apparently Iluvatar has put there to be in charge. Right. Right. Um, so, um, I don't know. It's just... It's interesting. And so, Christopher Tolkien brings this up again, back going back to Unfinished Tales. We had just read about how seemingly everything up until right on the... Very, like in the last year of his life, Tolkien had been thinking like Galadriel needed to atone, needed right, to do penance right. for her pride and her youth of refusing the the pardon of the Valar and, you know, listening to them in the first place. Um, and, you know, just in, in this last little bit he wrote, 
Um, uh, he says, uh, where is it? That um, it says in Feanor's revolt, she was in every way opposed to him. Um, she did indeed wish to depart from Valinor and to go to, into the wide world of Middle Earth for the exercise of her talents. For being brilliant in mind and swift in action, she had early absorbed all of what she was capable of the teaching which the Valar thought fit to give the Eldar, and she felt confined in the tutelage of Amon. This desire of Gladriel's was, it seems, known to Monway, and he had not forbidden her, but nor had she been given formal leave to depart. Pondering what she might do, Gladriel's thoughts turned to the ships of the Teleri, and she went for a while to dwell with her mother's kindred in Aqualande. There she met Celeborn, uh, and it goes into her meeting Celeborn there. In Fandor's revolt that followed the darkening of Valinor, Gladriel had no part. Indeed, she was Celeborn, She with Celeborn um, fought heroically in defense of Aqualande against the assault of the Noldor, and Celeborn's ship was saved from them. Galadriel, despairing now of Valinor and horrified by the violence and cruelty of Fanor, set sail into the darkness without waiting for Monway's leave, which would undoubtedly have been withheld in that hour, however legitimate her desire in itself. It was thus that she came under the ban set upon all departure, and Valinor was shut against her return. But together with Celeborn, she reached Middle-earth somewhat sooner than Val- Fanor and sailed into the haven where Círdan was lord. Um, and, and basically what he says is that she and Celeborn journeyed, continued journeying into the east really before there was a chance for them to come back after the end of the first age, right? Yes. So it's almost like they just got kind of happy where they were and decided not to come back. Um, and they say, yeah, and when they received the permission of the Valar to return into the west, they rejected it. So even, so even at the end of his life, it seems that they still rejected the opportunity to return to Valinor. Mm-hmm. So there is... Whether we attribute that to pride or whatever, I don't know if Tolkien would have still attributed it to pride there, but um, it would seem that they did reject the opportunity of the Valinor to come back. Right. right? Or the opportunity yeah. of the Valar to come back to Valinor, which for the Valar might have seemed like a big deal, might have seemed like obstinate, sort of prideful mm-hmm. rebellion. Yeah. Um, you know, you're like, you can come hang out with us in the most awesome place in the world, mm-hmm. but you're choosing to stay over there. What's up with that? You know, you right. know unless it was just an invitation. I mean, you have the right to decline an invitation. You you do, yeah. But you know, again, we're trying to figure out what was going through Tolkien's mind and was how much was he actually revising this and that sort of so thing. So that what you just read from Unfinished Tales was mm-hmm. that written after the two letters that you read before it? So that was written kind of con- uh, at the same time as that la- as the second letter. As the I read. second letter. So there was that change okay. in the last few years yeah, where it was, was like yeah. she was she was a rebel, not not as not a kinslaying rebel like Fanor, right. but she did out of pride refuse, mm-hmm. um, you know, re- refuse the uh, summons, right. you know, of, she didn't take an oath, but she refused the summons of the Valar and, um, and that she was a penitent. Yes. Um, and then we kind of, kind of a softer view of her right. in the last, in the last year and... of Tolkien's life. Yeah. Oh yeah. He kind of paints a picture of like wrong place, wrong time. Yeah, kind Exactly. Of. Later, you know, so, not not yeah. that there's this pride at stake, not that mm-hmm. there's this youthful obstinance, but more of um, just you know, like oh, it was da- just oh, bad darn. timing, exactly. really. I mean, because it sounded like, yeah, from what you just read, it sounded like she just she kind of felt suppressed and mm-hmm. like she kind of outgrown her, you know, whatever she had in Valinor, and she just kind of wanted to spread her wings a little bit, right? And Monway knew this and said she could go, you know, said you know, and would have let her go, yeah. But before he could, she got swept away with the yeah with the pack. Yeah, so it's interesting that he made that change. Right. Um, I don't know. You know, you think about maybe he was reflecting upon. I don't know. I, I get I get uncomfortable, but the thought is that uh, maybe he was reflecting upon his own life and things, mm-hmm. ways that he had maybe judged himself harshly. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Uh, a few years prior. You know, now that he was nearing the end of his life and. You know, even maybe, you know, possibly thinking about Edith or whatever. And, you know, she would have been passed at the point of, you know, in 1973, she would have been gone for a couple of years. Um, you know, maybe just that reflection that, like, looking back, you're like, well, you know, yeah, maybe I did some stupid things when I was younger. But and maybe I was obstinate in ways, but maybe it wasn't all, like, just hard-hearted evil, you know. Yeah. Maybe yeah. some of it was just being 
not realizing a good, you know, the, the, the better way or, or thinking that, you know, or valuing certain things which were valuable, you know, in and of themselves. So, you know, yeah. there, therein is the, that's the problem of Galadriel. Um, mm-hmm. how, how bad was her, <laughs> was, was her, um, refusal of the return, you know, in the first place of staying put and the return. It would yeah. seem that Tolkien's final word on it is, um, she was wrong place at the wrong time, but when she had the opportunity to return after the first age, she chose not to. Chose and not so that to. made it right. harder for her to return later. You know? Yeah. So it seems like, I mean, the outcome is the same. Mm-hmm. Right? She's still exiled in, all, in each of these scenarios. Right. It's just why. It's yeah. the why was she exiled in the first place. And it also right? puts into context the whole I passed the test thing, right? Because mm-hmm. we have those words about. What's the, well? What is the test really? Well, she's mm-hmm. tested by saying this could be all yours, mm-hmm. right? All of this, you know, all of Middle Earth could yeah. be yours yeah. if you just take the ring, right? Um, right. and and that's everything she ever wanted, apparently, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's Galadriel. That that's her. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more to that chapter in Unfinished Tales. If you want to go read more about her, there's a lot on her and Celeborn and. Um, you know how they became husband and wife. Um, there's um, you know she is the she's the grandmother of Arwen. Right. That's what we, we talked about in another episode. Yes. Um. So, with you know, that's an interesting little note. Um, and I think there's more that you could find too if you kept digging about oh, for sure. Gladriel. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, that's... Um. But yeah. Yeah. I I like it. Now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Yes. Yes. That's a true story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Yeah, well done. Uh, I know. I was afraid that was going to be a train wreck based on how we started off. Yeah. But I think I think you righted it pretty well. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, you, did you write a haiku? I did write a haiku. Okay, go ahead and read your haiku. haiku. I'm not going to I'm not gonna play the song because I didn't set it up. You didn't write, oh, you didn't set it up or because no. you didn't write one? Well, both. Okay. Here's my haiku for Galadriel. Elvin, Marion, the light of trees in her hair, proud, willful, redeemed. That's it. That's real nice, Greta. Thanks. Well done. Actually, I'm kind of proud of it. That's good. It really is good. <laughs> um, good stuff. Thanks. Fitting, fitting way to end the episode. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, next time, Akala Baith. Akalabith. Akalabith. Yeah. Uh, Which is the last part of the... Technically not the Silmarillion. It's technically not the Silmarillion, but, but it's, it's bundled with the Silmarillion. Bundled with, okay. Yeah. It's the second... It's it, uh, Akalabith is about Numenor in the Second Age. Okay. Numenor, which you'll learn about when you read Akalabith. Okay. So. All right. Yeah, it's like the bridge between the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So after that, we're gonna go back to Lord of the Rings. Yeah, we'll get. Yeah, we'll get back to Lord of the Rings for too long. Okay. Mm-hmm. All, right. All right. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, it does sound like a plan. Yeah. Uh, I know. I came up with it. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. I'll shut up now. Yeah. yeah th- uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Yes. Thank you, guys. And we'll talk at you next time. Yeah. Please remember to check out TrueMyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll discuss Akalabath, the chronicle of Numenor and the Second Age. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.